Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Gail and Chris on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes, and that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Do you have a need for legal counsel for your foreclosure, forfeiture, or eviction in Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, or Illinois? Do you have an account in bankruptcy in those states and need to discuss the matter and your options? How about an account that goes into bankruptcy in any of the 94 bankruptcy jurisdictions? The attorneys and staff at Sotilian and Barilli are here to assist you with those matters and more. Head on over to our Facebook page or our website at www.sotilianbarilli.com to find out more and to reach out to our team. When legal default experience matters, choose the team at Sotilian and Barilli. Hello, note friends, interested parties, people with IRAs who aren't invested wisely yet. Welcome to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am Gail Anthony Greenberg here with my beautiful assistant, Christopher Seveny. Hey, Gail. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Yes, we should say today is the first working day of 2019. And I don't know about you, Chris, but my carefully planned daily work schedule has already gone out the window. (laughs) But for a good reason. We're closing on a property tomorrow in Ohio, and they sent the closing documents. They arrived this morning. I had to dash out to get them notarized, and they're winging their way back right now for a closing tomorrow. So that seemed like a good reason to blow my beautifully crafted schedule. (laughs) Well, I had for the holidays, several individuals give me different types of planners, and I've got literally four different planners right now sitting on my desk and I'm laughing because I probably won't use any of them. But uh, you invented planning. You have taken planning to a whole new level. No, actually one of them is a productivity planner that I quickly peruse through it that it's actually pretty interesting on how they put some tasks and things to assign things in there. But I'll take a look. But as you know, I like to keep everything planned, but I've, you know, I'm very peculiar, I guess, is a term in my systems and very finicky and picky. So <laughs> so I'm curious. I do have a date book, you know, where I kind of haphazardly put things. What does a productivity planner have that a regular old calendar doesn't have? So this one, it's a, a book and it has, it starts off with like top five tasks of the week that you want to get done and then secondary tasks and then notes. And then it goes down from there for each day of the week, what's the most important task. And then it's got tracking time to see how much time you spend on the task uh, or how much time you anticipate on spending on it and how much time you actually spent on the task. So, Right. uh, So I would need one that by Thursday, they've pre-printed a threatening message about the fact that you're not on schedule anymore. (laughs) That would be very helpful to me. But Actually, the tracking that you mentioned, my daughter just informed me. I just got a new iPhone and it has a function on it that actually tracks for you how much time you've spent, you know, on social media and stuff. Like, oh my God, what an eye opener that is. No more denial. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it tracks how much time you're online and your screen time as Uh well as what you can track and so forth. Yeah. It's pretty uh, shameful. I'm not happy. So yeah, the, so the highlight of my holiday, as you already know, is that as happens every year, I had a birthday between Christmas and New Year's, you know, that dead zone where nobody wants to do anything. Yep. I decided there wasn't going to be any sitting around moping this time. And I bought the family a session at a hatchet throwing place. And I discovered that my children are absolutely lethal with hatchets. (laughs) I'm so glad they're no longer in school. They are adults. There's no one in immediate danger, you know, if they assign too much homework to them or whatever. But, you know, the rest of the world should be very concerned about them. And uh, I also found out that I pose literally no danger to anyone with a hatchet. I am like a little baby lamb in terms of how dangerous I am. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, this is upsetting to me because no one tells you when you start out with children, 
they're so helpless and you easily are better than them at everything that you do. And at some point the tables turn and now, you know, I'm finding yet another thing that they're much better than me at. So yeah, the hatchet throwing thing, I've seen a few of those starting to pop up now is kind of a the next interesting big thing in some type of entertainment. I know a few years ago it was kind of that indoor go-kart racing. Oh, that's but, I still like that. Yep, that's still <laughs> entertaining for me. You know, my holidays consisted of I did a quick trip up to Massachusetts to visit my mother and sisters and family. And then we've had my wife's family is now uh, departed as of this morning, but they spent a few weeks with us as well down here. But it was good to spend time with the family. Kids had very good time and are happy and are now actually heading up to, I'll say your state tomorrow to go skiing. So. Oh, really? They don't have to go back to school yet? Nope. Or is that the weekend? Nope. They don't have to go back till Monday. So. Oh my God. That's awesome. Wow. Personally, if I had any more bit time off interacting with my family, I think I would have lost my mind or I would have gotten better at that hatchet throwing. <laughs> <laughs> One or the other. <laughs> Did you have a few drinks before you started throwing? <laughs> no, it probably would have really helped. But, you know, it's funny too. Like, you know, there's a lot of achievers in our business. I know you're one too. And like, I don't react very well to not being good at things. You know, it was a little bit of a struggle for me, but seeing my kids enjoy themselves so much <laughs> made it easier. But I still kind of like, why can't I throw a hatchet? I don't understand. But I'm okay with just being good at notes and let's leave the hatchets lie. Okay, so it's probably time now we, I'll say, yeah, let's do some work here. reminiscing and start providing some yeah. Good feedback and information for our listeners. Do something you can actually do something with other than hatchet throwing is fun. You should go. So, yeah, our main topic for today is one that is a favorite of mine and you've helped me with a lot. This segment, this podcast should be called, Is It Safe to Talk to Borrowers? How and when do you want to talk to borrowers? Do you even want to talk to borrowers? And can you get into serious trouble talking to borrowers? So I actually had a lot of beliefs about this topic. I was the original person who was terrified to talk to a borrower. I can remember the second note I ever bought. The borrower called me because with the servicer, FCI, that that note was at, if you don't supply them with the name of an outreach person or an attorney, if a borrower calls them for any reason, they give them your phone number. I think it's kind of the way that they kind of punish you for not hiring them to do the borrower outreach. It's like, you either let us do it or we're going to have them call you. I saw that the number was from Georgia. And at that time, I didn't know anyone in Georgia. And I just, I froze because I thought, oh my God, I know I'm not allowed to talk to this person. What do I do? And of course, that was ridiculous because the first things to know is if a borrower calls you, None of the normal Consumer Financial Protection Bureau rules really apply. Is that your impression also? That is, but I always, you know, for me, I just follow the same pattern all the time. You know, I'm more of a, I'll say, even more conservative. I know yeah, you're a belt and suspenders <laughs> kind of a guy. Yeah, I'm an engineer. Well, I'm an engineer. So first, just want to make a statement that none of us are providing legal advice and all that other CYA stuff about this information. You should all verify it and go take a class on it. But, you know, for me, Gail, I am probably even less enticed to talk to borrowers than you are. I know you do a lot of your borrower outreaches now. For me, I like to keep those with my servicer, but I still definitely like to be educated and informed in case they do pick up the phone and call me or reach out to me. So when they do call, which it's not too often, typically I actually will let it go to voicemail just to see what type of message they're going to leave. And then I usually will call them back. And then when I do, I'll still read them what's called that mini Miranda, which is for debt collecting. You know, people think of Miranda you know, if somebody's getting arrested, but in debt yeah, collecting- you have the right just, to remain silent. Yeah. In debt collecting, it's just, this is an attempt to collect the debt and then any information obtained will be used for that purpose. Right. So- Yeah. So we should say in an introductory way, like who is it who makes the rules about talking to borrowers? It's really 
about the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And I guess the enforcement arm is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Is that your impression also? Yes. That's who people would complain to. Your borrowers would complain to if you ever break one of the rules. So we're here. And I actually printed out some information off the CFPB website just to make sure that even though we are not attorneys and we are not advising you, dear listeners, to do this or not do this, I could at least give you some pretty complete information. So first thing that I want to say, and this is something that you really should verify because it makes all the rest of this potentially not necessary. I had heard this as a rumor that if you are the actual lender and not a third party collector, you actually don't have to follow any of these rules other than the common sense rules about not harassing people and not calling them at crazy hours and things like that. So it turns out that it actually says on the website that the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act generally does not cover collection by the original creditor to whom you first became indebted. So we are not the first owners of most of these notes. We buy them from other people. So we are not the first creditor, but we still fall into that category of being the creditor, not a collection agency, a, an attorney who regularly collects debts, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's the wrinkle. Under the FDCPA, Debt collectors include debt buyers. So now we're back in the gray area where, okay, we're debt buyers, right? So now we are required to do this. So it's, I mean, people listening are like, huh? The the consensus is like a lot of things, I'll say related to federal or state agencies. There's probably something that says here you don't have to do it and here you have to do it. So our recommendation is always go. Yes, just do it. Because there's also state laws, which may have something different as part of state laws. So right. this is really a common sense approach when you're talking with people and you know, basically having the conversations with them and being professional, respectful, and just following some simple guidelines and rules. Right. So be like Nike and just do it. So let's just talk for a second about, you know, who wants to do it and who doesn't want to do it. You don't want to do it mostly as a matter of time. And this is the way that you manage to run a large note business and also have like a whole other big life and big job going on at the same time. You let your servicer do the borrower outreach. There is also an option to have an attorney do the outreach. And I know debt, I know note buyers who just, as soon as they buy a distressed, non-performing note, they just hire an attorney. And I always thought that was kind of crazy. But now that I see how many borrowers need that kind of official letterhead with an attorney name on it to come to the table, that strikes me as not a terrible idea. It doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily take it all the way to the end and do a foreclosure or a forfeiture, but just sending a demand letter is often the thing that gets people's attention and really gets them to call you. So, And then I know people who just dislike talking to people. They don't like problem solving. They just want, you know, they just want the people to start paying and not give them any kind of excuses or whatever. And a note buyer who literally, as soon as he gets a note, he'll put the borrowers, he'll skip trace the borrowers just to get all the possible phone numbers for them and put them in his phone under like the borrower category. So when the caller ID comes up and it says borrower, he just doesn't answer. (laughs) He never wants to talk to a borrower. He doesn't care what's going on. Yeah, they could want to give him $10,000. He just does not want to talk to them. Forget about it. And some people also because of, you know, people may hear stories from other people about things that have happened or and have gotten sued. And, you know, there's extreme cases and every sent, you know, in every aspect of every business. So, you know, typically you only hear those disaster and horror stories. So I think that also sometimes has people to shy away from. But, you know, for me, it's more, again, about the time and what's the best use of my time. Exactly. I typically do not. Right. So I'm a people person. I feel like 
you know, relationships is a little bit my genius zone, but it's not even like that I, you know, I need the human contact so badly, but I've been in so many situations where there was an intermediary, you know, somebody was calling people for me and, you know, they would report back, oh, they said such and such. And I'd be like, well, did you say such and such? And they were like, no. And it's just frustrating to me because I feel like I'm a pretty high level problem solver and nobody that I ever hired to do outreach for me ever kind of really had the conversation the way I thought it should happen. And that I thought you would get most directly to a conclusion. It costs time for me to make those calls and therefore it costs money. But I feel like sometimes I get like a much swifter resolution or I get clarity much quicker. And then, you know, so I feel like it sort of balances out. So let's talk about how you call people. The main, main thing, as Chris already said, is that as soon as you get the person, the correct person on the line, you give the mini Miranda. This call isn't, a, you know, sometimes people say I'm required to tell you that this call is an attempt to collect a debt and any information given will be used for that purpose. But before you even get that far, you have to make sure you have the right person. And if you look in servicing notes, you will see that they confirm that they got the right party, like right party contact. Yes. So who is the right party? If you have a married couple, but only one of them is on the note, that person's spouse is not someone you can talk to at all. You can assume all you want that they know everything about this loan and the fact that it's delinquent and everything else, whatever the reason is that you're calling. But legally, you cannot speak to anyone who is not on the loan. And also, you're not sure they're even the spouse. So exactly. you could say they're the spouse, but that's a good point, whether it's their mother, their father, if it's not that right party, there's actually very little you can tell them. You're not even supposed to tell them the name of your company or mm-hmm. the purpose while you're calling. You're just trying to get information from them on asking them, how can I reach out to get in contact with them? It's regarding a personal issue. Yeah. You can't tell them there's a debt, that they are late on a debt. <laughs> that you are <laughs> contemplating taking some action because of the lateness. None of those things. We actually started talking about this several months ago when I was looking for a woman who had abandoned a house and they had a land contract. She and her friend had a land contract on a house and she had moved away and left her friend kind of holding the bag on the land contract. And I was trying to track the woman down just to see if I could get her to sign a cancellation of land contract. So at least I could just work with the one woman who was still there. And this woman could not be found. And I eventually ended up calling her adult son. Another thing, she's an elderly lady in her 80s. And, you know, before I knew the rules, I'm telling her adult son, oh, you know, I'm her lender. I'm trying to find her. Like, ah. <laughs> Luckily, no one cared, (laughs) or that could have been bad. So So, you saved me that time, Seveny. Thank you. Yeah, And one thing I'll mention, and I know you've got a list of questions and so forth, but I'll tag along with, you know, when you reach out and call somebody is don't leave a voice message either. Right. And the reason why. And don't send an email. (laughs) (laughs) Voice connection only. Yes. And the reason not to leave a voicemail is because if it's a person's house phone, And again, they have roommates or whatever the case may be, then somebody else is hearing that message and technically that could be a violation. So that's one reason, again, that if you're calling somebody, you know, if you get them, great. But if you don't, don't leave a message for them. So Gail, while you're rolling into it, I know you got some things. Well, I just have to say something on that point. Like doctors have the same rules about leaving information. And I have a friend whose doctor left him a voicemail that he had cancer. Can you imagine? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, luckily he's fine. Everything's fine. He's cured. But holy cow. First of all, that's not the type of thing you leave a voice message for. Yeah, totally. That is a caring healer. What other pearls of wisdom do you have for a scale? Okay. So, well, I wanted to, before we move on from the leaving a voicemail and getting the right party, I don't really remember, and I don't see it on here, when you call someone's work, 
yeah. and they're like, who's calling or whatever. They leave a voicemail on a work phone if it's the person's own mailbox. Can you tell someone else who answers the phone if they say, like, what's the reason for the call? Yeah. So on the work phones, again, I just keep it. I don't leave voice messages on that. If it's somebody's executive assistant or something, again, I would just say it's calling about a personal matter. But in regards to the workplace, if you do get somebody on the phone at the workplace, and they say, I cannot take calls at work, that is basically their get out of jail free card in the sense of you can't continue to call them at work. If they stipulate to you, I can't receive calls at work, you are not allowed to continue to call them. If you do, it could be considered harassment and a major violation. Right, right, right. Do we actually know what happens to you if you violate any of these? It's typically, it's about $1,000 per offense um, is what it is. And is that each call to the workplace after getting a message would be an offense? Yes. An offense (laughs) is each action. So if you do something now, if one action consisted of three violations, then it's just that one action. But if you were constantly doing it, it's my understanding that it's per each occurrence. Right. Okay. So we should also mention that there's ways to kind of automate this a little bit. And I know some people who have phone numbers, like Google voice numbers that they set up, which is sort of their borrower line that they, it's the phone number they give if they send out a welcome letter to their borrowers, like, you know, please call me at this phone number. And they will put a voicemail message on there that already has the mini Miranda on it. Like, thank you for calling. I want you to understand that this is an attempt to collect a debt and any information will be used for that purpose. You'll notice too, if you use attorneys that do a lot of collection, that they all have signature lines that put the mini Miranda in there. I think servicer communications all do also. Like it's a good practice to just go ahead and put these things Just kind of cover yourself and get it kind of set up so you don't have to be thinking about it all the time. Obviously, if you have one or two notes, it's not going to be a big deal. But when you have like 50, 60, you know, people are going to call you. It's just handy too. Yeah, I use Twilio, T-W-I-L-I-O. And I've got numbers there for my entities that same thing is if somebody calls before the phone even rings to me, it's an automated message that is the mini Miranda. And then once that's done, the phone gets forwarded to me. So I don't need to repeat it. I already know from them calling that number, which comes through to my phone, that that's already been stated. Perfect. Well, i leave it to you to have that already worked out. Okay. So here are the other specific things. Restrictions on communications by debt collectors. Time and place. Generally, debt collectors cannot contact you at an unusual time or place or a time or place they know is inconvenient for you. (laughs) There are the dogs. Puppies. So typically, the from what I have read, the norm or standard is not before 8 a.m., not after 9 p.m. Oh, perfect. Yes. In their time. In their time zone, and that's Monday through Saturday. Typically, contacting somebody on Sunday is not kosher. Oh, I wish I had known that a few days ago. I try to catch people right after church. (laughs) Just kidding. Okay, so yes, you're absolutely right. But not before eight, not after nine. If the debt collector knows you're not allowed to receive calls at work, they're not allowed to contact you there. Cover, check, check that box. Okay, harassment. Debt collectors may not harass you or anyone else over the phone or through any other form of contact. Okay, you'll notice a certain lack of detail about what constitutes harassment. (laughs) It leaves everyone wide open for interpretation. And harassment could be, I'm sending somebody to your house, to telling somebody I am going to foreclose on you could be considered harassment. Right, or I'll start legal action. Yeah, or start legal action. So, you know, from that perspective, you know, I'm very careful in not telling anybody. Typically, we'll just say, I will review that and I'll be sending you, you know, a letter in the mail. And that could be the demand letter, could be a cash for keys offer, but typically I won't tell the person 
well, if you don't pay by this date, I'm doing legal, or if you don't do this, because that could be construed as harassment. Right. So let's just assume that anything stronger, any threat stronger than I'm not going to send you a birthday card this year should be avoided at all costs. Maintain a calm and level demeanor. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I have a very dear friend who went to do an inspection of a house for me where we were trying to ascertain the, just the, whether it was in a safe condition or not. And was greeted by an angry borrower and just gave it back as good as he got. (laughs) I mean, it was fortunate that we weren't attempting to collect a debt in that moment, but it was pretty funny. And I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to use that video in court for anything. Okay. Representation by an attorney. If a debt collector knows that an attorney is representing you, you notice like this language is all from the standpoint of you, the borrower are reading this and trying to determine if you have a cause of action against your debt buyer who has called you. So let me just flip it around. If we know that an attorney is representing the borrower, then the debt collector has to stop contacting you and has to contact the attorney instead. Yep, correct. And if they tell you that they have an attorney, you just ask, can I have their contact information? And then you get that, and then you can reach back and reach out to that attorney says, though, that this is only true if the debt collector knows or can easily find out the name and contact information of your attorney. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, how would you easily find out? Only if it's a bankruptcy, can you easily find out? (laughs) Well, if there was, you know, basically they responded to a letter that said, I have an attorney, something maybe along those lines. Their attorney responded. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. The Consumer Financial Protection Board has prepared sample letters you can use to respond to a debt collector who's trying to collect a debt. I don't think I've ever received one of those. Have you? I have received not a sample letter, but I did receive a few weeks ago a borrower who is disputing a debt. So, which is an interesting topic because if it is disputed, you can't reach back out to them until you have validated the debt. So what does what does that mean? Get like a complete response from the servicer or what? Yes. So what it entails in this instance is I had to show the complete chain of title that I own that note. So you needed the original note, all the assignments and mortgages and the allonges. So a complete package basically saying, okay, my entity actually does own this. Then had to also provide the complete pay history on the asset as well. So until all of that is provided to the borrower, that's a sign that you cannot, and it's typically, I think they have 30 days to dispute a debt from you, send them a letter. So once my attorney sends them all that information, then reach out can continue to ensue. Okay. So is that what is known as a qualified written response? A QWR? I believe it is. Okay. Yeah, those are, if you ever get, so that's often the first volley in a lawsuit is demanding that if someone is disputing the accuracy of your information on what they owe and what they've paid, et cetera, et cetera. And a QWR, I found this out the hard way. The servicer prepares it and the servicer has only so much time to prepare it. And if they miss the deadline to get it to the attorney or the borrower, (laughs) you are in a very much weaker position in the lawsuit, you know, because now they have a cause of action against the servicer. I actually, I've talked about this before, but I had a servicer. I'd only owned a contract for deed for a very short time. They had a major beef with the previous servicer, but my servicer got dragged into it because that one thing, they had not produced the qualified written response by the deadline. And because of that, it probably cost me 14, 1500 bucks, you know, and I actually had to amend the loan also, because basically hell had no fury like this borrower once they got rolling. So it was a costly lesson, (laughs) we'll just say. Okay. So it looks like there's a lot of guidelines on here about how to use the CFPB's sample letters if you're a borrower, what they can and can't do to make you stop, 
what they can demand from us, the fact that they can dispute the debt. There's very complete information online. I think this is the takeaway. A motivated borrower who wants to fight with you and give you a hard time because you broke one of these contact rules has very complete information. They have a friend in the CFPB. There's a lot of great information on the website. Probably everybody should go to the CFPB's website and just familiarize yourself with what the agency is telling people they can and should do. And I also want to say, I mean, we're kind of acting like, you know, borrowers are being really difficult here, but obviously the reason these rules exist is because there have been incredibly bad, horrific harassment cases against people who owe money, not just on their mortgage, but medical debt, credit card debt. I mean, obviously the collection agencies buy these debts for very little money and then just put incredible, incredible, nasty effort into getting the money any way that they can. So yes, we don't want people giving us a hard time when we're being nice, but I mean, just understand that there's a reason these rules exist. It's not really about people like us. I hope everyone out there is treating people decently and fair-minded in your interactions with borrowers. Yeah, and you know, another thing you can do is you can go on some of these FDCPA or you know CFPB websites and so forth. Or, or one thing I did is I just went and I took a, I think it was like a hundred bucks, is just kind of a course on this online. That was, I think, pretty helpful because they go through videos and some other things that show really what you can and can't do. And I think I took that through a website called acainternational.org, which is the Association of Credit and Collection Professionals. So we'll leave that link in the show notes. But from there, they've got all different types of rules and laws and stuff like that kind of in training. It was really what it is. It's videos that you can watch that are just like, okay, this is good information that they have. And it's typically what credit bureaus or, you know, those companies or debt collectors, usually they'll send people through a certification program like that so they can learn. But, you know, for me, I just like to, even if I'm not doing it, know what the rules are. So in case I do get a phone call or I do have to talk to somebody, because I do once in a while, the attorney will say, hey, look, can you reach out to this guy? This guy wants to work something out with you. Instead of me being the middleman, just give him a call directly. Right, exactly. Whether you want to or not, you're probably going to talk to a borrower at some yep. point. So it's just good to know. I can't believe I forgot the Sunday thing after watching all those things. But <laughs> anywho, okay, let's get into our notes and bolts, unless you have anything else about... Uh, one more thing to add. Okay. If they do say during the call that, please stop calling me, right. you have to stop calling them. Yes. Uh, you're allowed to send them one follow-up letter from that point to say confirming I'm terminating conversation or that letter can also (laughs) say that I'm taking legal action, whatever it is. But essentially, you know, someone says, hey, leave me alone or don't call me. You can't keep calling them. Even though if they owe you money, you just have to find another means to get the issue resolved. So does that mean not only can you not call them again, but you can't have anyone else call them either? Like that's it? Correct. This is good to know in case anybody out there owes anybody money. (laughs) These are the magic words. Stop calling me. Yeah, because I mean, you know, look at this way, Gail. If you and I were partner on a deal, I'm calling somebody and each entity we had had 50%. I call them first, says, leave me alone. I can't just have you call them, then the servicer, then the attorney. (laughs) That's kind of, I think, skirting the rules a little bit. Yeah, what if I put on like a different hat and now I'm a new person? I have my other identity, like a split personality. What if my stern grandmother calls him? (laughs) All right, well, excellent. I think that was a juicy episode, Chris. Thank you. So let's move on to notes and bolts. I have a kind of, this is not much of a note and bolt, but it's on my mind, so I just want to say it. I started out today, first work day of 2019 with a very carefully worked out plan for how my days are supposed to go. And, you know, basically by 1030, it was all over. So I just wanted to say, like, I did feel some momentary upset about that. And I think what I've realized is that it's important to have a plan and it's important to be really flexible also so that you don't miss opportunities to send back the closing documents that are going to get us a big chunk of money instead of sticking to my strict schedule. So my comment will be, you know, with it being the start of a new year and wrapping up the final year, 
remember within your note business, anyone who you have paid a bill to or any partners you have that you've given them interest to make sure you have a 1099 from them. So I've you know gone through over the weekend and just it was a few while I was missing and reach out to somebody and they're like, well, why do you need one from me? And I'm like, because you're getting money or you've gotten money. So that's just a side note to make sure that you have that taken care of because your accountant, bookkeeper, or somebody will definitely be asking for it. So easier to chase it down now than wait to have your returns be delayed from filing because you're waiting for some paperwork. I think our next podcast should really be about like end of year wrap up paperwork and steps. Yeah. Does that sound like an idea? That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Give you the honor of wrapping up this episode as well, Gail. Okay, everybody. Thanks again for being with us. Hope you had a great holiday and you're excited about what we're all going to do in 2019. For me, I'll just say, go out there and do some good deeds. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast with Chris Seveny and Gail Anthony Greenberg. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.